and welcome to After Alexander. Episode 37. Declaring a God. Last time, we covered the rise and fall of the enigmatic Ptolemy the Younger, the eldest son of Ptolemy II and Arsidoe I. This Ptolemy was made co-king with his father, as represented on the Mendes Stele. However, his co-kingship came to an end after he rebelled against Ptolemy II from Ephesus, although how he died varies from source to source. This might not in itself be that remarkable. However, the events that follow on from the failed rebellion of this Ptolemaic prince lead us towards the Second Syrian War. So, today, let's briefly recap the rebellion and discuss the fallout from its failure. Before we go any further, a brief note on the identity of the prince in question. There is a bit of a dispute about who exactly this is. The three major candidates that I've seen listed are Ptolemy of Telmessus, the son of Arsinoe II and Lysimachus, Ptolemy the Younger, the elder brother of Ptolemy III, and Ptolemy Andromachu, the illegitimate son of Ptolemy II. Our second option, who I've designated Ptolemy the Younger to avoid confusion, seems to be the most likely candidate. With that in mind, I'll be sticking to identifying our protagonist as Ptolemy the Younger, but just know there are question marks associated with all of this. So, At some point, Ptolemy the Younger ends up in Ephesus. We noted last episode that Ptolemy II may have placed his son there, both in a bid to act more aggressively and expansionist once Antiochus I died, but also to give his son and co-king his political training wheels. Alternatively, the Ptolemaic prince in question may have been on a tour of the provinces, or even placed in Ephesus after the Second Syrian War began, rather than being the cause of it, depending on the source. Ephesus is located in approximately the middle of the western Anatolian seaboard facing Greece. It had at one point been a Seleucid possession, but had fallen into Ptolemaic hands in either the final years of the reign of Antiochus I, or the early days of the reign of Antiochus II. Now, Ptolemy the Younger was installed there at the head of a mostly Thracian garrison. However, he rebelled against his father, in collusion with a man known as Timarchus. Now, this needs some explaining. Who is Timarchus? Well, he appears to have been an Aetolian mercenary leader who had once defeated a Ptolemaic general on the Asian coast. Timarchus was installed as a garrison commander at Miletus, a city located in the southwest of Anatolia, before taking control of the city in a coup. He thus ended up becoming the tyrant of Miletus, a city which had previously been under Ptolemaic hegemony. Timarchus had no intention of kneeling before either of the two great powers in the region, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. He wanted to stand alone, which could have been plausible given he had the potential to play the two off each other. After he became tyrant of the region, Ptolemy the Younger rebelled and the two men made a pact with one another. It's at this point that our story splits into several versions again. Granger writes that Timarchus took control of Samos before joining Ptolemy the Younger in Ephesus as planned, betraying him and assassinating him, thereby extending his control over a respectable chunk of territory in Miletus, Samos, and Ephesus. It was after this point that the two major powers reasserted themselves, which we'll get back to in a moment. However, Bevan recounts a different version. According to his account, both Ptolemy the Younger and Timarchus misjudged the strength of their position. As we'll circle back to, Timarchus was killed by Antiochus II. The garrison in Ephesus, mostly consisting of men from Thrace, as I mentioned earlier, grew mutinous. I'm going to quote from Bevan what he wrote happened next. Quote, Ptolemy fled with his mistress Irene to the great temple of Artemis. The Thracians, undaunted by its sanctities, followed him up and there slew him. Irene, holding with one hand to the knocker of the door, so as herself also to claim the protection of the goddess, with the other sprinkled her lover's blood upon the holy things till she too was cut down. Ephesus passed once more to the Seleucid. 
End quote. In addition, there is always the potential possibility that Ptolemy II put his son to death after his rebellion, but only one of my sources mentions this as a possibility, and their chronology supports the idea that Ptolemy the Younger died violently at the hands of his Thracian soldiers. But now, on to this intervention I've mentioned a few times already. Antiochus II would recapture the city of Miletus, as I alluded to above. He subsequently deposed and killed Timarchus, for which the city appears to have been grateful, or at least seeking to flatter their new hegemon. It is at this point that Antiochus II first gets his ancient epithet of Theos, or the god, which the people of Miletus appear to have awarded him. Now, we know that Miletus passed to the Seleucids and Samos to the Ptolemies. Different sources I've used disagree somewhat over which power took control of Ephesus, but the overall picture appears to be that Ephesus passed to the Seleucids, with an inscription dating to 253 BCE apparently confirming this. It also successfully withstood an attempt to take it by the Ptolemies. Regardless, the important city for our purposes is not Ephesus, but Miletus. Miletus was an important city and seaport at the time, and this was the first time that an Anatolian coastal city of its kind had decisively transferred from the Ptolemies to the Seleucids. In stark contrast to the subtle city-building of Antiochus I, or the installation of Ptolemy II's nephew in his father's old heartland in Telmessus, this was always going to be seen as a provocation. Accordingly, Granger's chronology labels the seizure of Miletus as the opening salvo of the Second Syrian War. Antiochus II appears to have been the aggressor in starting the war. The Seleucid dynasty had apparently been unable to focus on Egypt and the Mediterranean for a while due to internal strife. Now, Antiochus II was sufficiently confident that he could wind back the clock and undo his father's losses to Egypt a decade earlier. The Second Syrian War would rage for most of the reign of Antiochus II. However, all of that will have to wait for future episodes. Instead, let's use the excuse of Miletus declaring Antiochus a god to examine some of the empire's cults during his reign. An inscription found in 1884 gives us some insight into how the Seleucid king was worshipped, as per royal instruction. And yes, you heard me correctly, royal instruction. Let me explain. Now, cities already made offerings to Alexander the Great, as we saw over in Egypt, as well as the first generation of his successors. Before 277 BCE, a priest of Antiochus I appears in the city of Ilion. In Erythrae, Antiochus I had games thrown in his honour after his death in 261, and was worshipped by his epithet of saviour. Antiochus I's wife Stratonike was actually joined to Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, as Aphrodite Stratonikis. The Ionian cities would associate worship of Antiochus I, Antiochus II, and Stratonike to that of Alexander the Great. What you may have noticed in all of this is that these cults are local and at the scale of cities. Barring the inscription found in 1884, we don't see any mention of imperially mandated cults. This inscription may mean that Antiochus II was the first ruler to create such an official cult, but Bevan cautions that absence of evidence isn't necessarily evidence of absence. After all, it may have been around as early as Seleucus I, but we would never know without the necessary evidence. So, what is this document? Well, it's the text of a communication from Antiochus II to Anaximbrotus, who Bevan presumed to be the governor of Phrygia. This text was then sent on to Dionytus, an official lower down the chain of command. In the text, the king notes that worship of himself is already present in multiple satrapies across his kingdom. In each satrapy, the cult is subordinate to a high priest, who was presumed to have been appointed annually. The missive stated that Antiochus II had now decided that a similar cult should be set up for Laodike I, his queen, and that there should be a high priestess in each satrapy. One final thing of note with this document is that, for Anaximbrotus' satrapy, the high priestess to be sworn in is a certain Berenike. This Berenike is, apparently, the daughter of Ptolemy of Telmessus. 
The Milesians had worshipped Antiochus II as a god because of his ejection of Timarchus. However, Antiochus II subsequently spread the cult across his empire and created one for his wife to boot. We don't know if this is the first time such a practice appeared in the Seleucid Empire. However, it is the first time that we have any concrete evidence for it. With that diversion out of the way, next time we'll return to the war. Specifically, we'll examine the Seleucid alliance with Antiochus II's uncle Antigonus II, as well as the role the Antigonids will play in the Second Syrian War. In the meantime, thank you all for listening. For any questions or comments, feel free to get in touch at the show's email address. Until next time, have a great week, everyone. Thank you.